And good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I do appreciate you being with me. Hope you had an absolutely fantastic weekend. We finally got a little bit of warm weather. Not really warm, but, you know, a whole lot warmer. Pardon me, than the ice storm that we had. Roads were clear, so it was a pretty enjoyable weekend. So hope you had a great time, safe time over the weekend. Um, want to continue this morning our examination of the Olivet Discourse. We have been focused for a good long while now on Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following to demonstrate its unity with the entirety of the discourse, proving that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is not talking about some end of time, uh, end of the Christian age event. It is talking about the time of the coming of the Lord at the end of the old covenant age to harvest that age. It is not the harvest of the entire earth. It is the harvest of the old covenant age and all that went before to usher in the new endless creation. Failure to understand that is endemic in Christianity. I was raised believing that Matthew 25, 31 and following, end of time. When the earth is burned up, the earth and the elements that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3.10. It wasn't until I really began to examine the correlations, the connections between Matthew 25, 31 and following with the Old Testament, which was a shock to me, and the rest of the New Testament that I really began to realize our traditional applications of Matthew 25, 31 and following simply does not work. Now, last couple of videos, I've been focused in, focused on sharing with you the fact that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, no matter what we might think of it, is simply the reiteration of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. Now, why, why am I spending time on this? Well, it's very simple, okay? The amillennial world in which I was raised teaches emphatically God was through with Old Covenant Israel at the cross. The law of Moses was nailed to the cross. Just this morning, I was engaging with an individual on Facebook who insisted, now he's not a member of the Church of Christ, he's not an amillennialist, but he claims that the law of Moses was nailed to the cross. Well, Listen, ladies and gentlemen, again, that's the view that I was raised in. It's what I believed, it's what I taught, even debated, until I found out better. The very verses that are used to prove that the law of Moses was nailed to the cross, found in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Paul told the Gentile Christians who were being pressured to keep the law of Moses Paul says, let no man judge you in respect of new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths. Now notice, which are present active indicative when Paul wrote in AD 62. A, they are a shadow of the good things about to come. I think it's interesting and significant. Gary DeMar has recently pointed out and come to understand what preterists have been saying for a good long while that the Greek word mellow that is found there, it doesn't mean simply certain to occur, not denying that it, that it entails certainty whatsoever, but rather it means imminence, about to be. So that means that Paul, writing years after the cross, was affirming that the law remained valid and binding as shadows of good things that were, when he wrote, about to be revealed. Now, what that means is, ladies and gentlemen, is that if Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is a reiteration of God's old covenant promises 
made to Old Covenant Israel, it means that Israel, at the time that Jesus spoke those words, and at the time Paul wrote his words, it means that the, the Old Covenant remained valid, imposed as shadows of the good things about to come, just like Hebrews chapter 10. After talking about Christ, who appeared at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, he had entered into the most holy place there to prepare that and would appear again the second time apart from sin to those who were eagerly, apodekomai is the Greek word, and it means an eager, expectant, looking for. You didn't, ex you did not epidecomai, something that you knew was thousands of years away. That violates the linguistics. But after talking about Jesus in his high priestly function, function, having appeared, sacrificed himself, entered into the most holy place, and to come out again, he says, chapter 10, verse 1, and there's no chapter division, okay? But in chapter 9, verse 28, first of all, he shall appear a second time apart from sin. That's to fulfill the typological actions of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Christ had appeared, sacrificed, and would appear out of the most holy place. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, in an amazing statement that is ignored by most commentators, he says, for, here's the reason Christ was to appear again the second time for salvation, just like the high priest came out of the most holy place, quote, for salvation, to announce the atonement was consummated. So the writer of Hebrews says, for, that is, Christ must appear again the second time, for, because, the law having a shadow of the good things about to come. And that's present active, just like Colossians. So watch this now. Matthew 25, 31 and following is the second coming of Christ. Virtually no one disagrees with that. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. It's the coming of Christ for salvation. It was typified, prophesied in the typological actions of Yom Kippur. That means that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is based upon, and it was the anticipation of, the fulfillment of God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel. Now, look, I've had people lately on YouTube and Facebook say, well, yeah, uh, the law had to be fulfilled, but not the prophets. Well, I'm sorry, Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, the law prophesied. The law prophesied. How did the law prophesy? Well, the law prophesied by foreshadowing the judgment, the atonement parousia, and the resurrection harvest of the final three feast days, which were commanded and mandated in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, let me ask you a question. Is Leviticus chapter 23 part of, quote, the law? So here we have Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, anticipating the fulfillment of the law, which foreshadowed the coming of Christ out of the most holy place to bring salvation. Well, is Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, about the coming of salvation at the second coming? Remember, second coming, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. To those who eagerly look for him, he shall appear again the second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Okay, second coming for salvation. Matthew chapter 25, the coming of Christ for salvation, but the second coming of Christ was foreshadowed, prophesied in the feast day of Yom Kippur. 
Thus, unless you can prove that, you know, Leviticus chapter 23 is not the law that had to be fulfilled before it could pass away, or unless you can prove that Matthew chapter 25, 31 is a totally different salvation, a coming of Christ for salvation from that of Hebrews chapter 9, which is very clearly anticipating the coming of Christ in fulfillment of the typology of the, la of the old law, Day of Atonement, unless you can delineate between those and create Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following as a brand new prophecy of the coming of the Lord for salvation, then that means that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following was the anticipation of the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to Israel. But wait a minute. Remember, all millennialist, post-millennialist, and even most premillennialist, both historic and dispensational, tell us, you know what? The law of Moses, uh, you know, Leviticus 23, was done away at the cross, or at least in the first century. But wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. The dispensationalists especially are guilty of a humongous error and self-contradiction. On, on the one hand, they say, as Thomas Ice does, that the law of Moses was fulfilled and passed away in the first century. They turn right around and tell us we're still waiting for the fulfillment of the final three feast days. Wait a minute. That's in the, that's in the law of Moses of, of, of Leviticus 23 and Numbers chapter 28. You cannot say the law of Moses, once again, that inc included the feast days. You cannot say the law of Moses was done away with, fulfilled in the first century, turned right around and say we're still waiting for the fulfillment of the final three feast days without creating a humongous, humongous contradiction. And so, Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is demonstrated to be based upon and the anticipation of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel found in Leviticus and Numbers 28 and a host of other passages of the Old Testament. You know, Matthew 25 is the coming of the Lord to bring in the new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 65, promise of the new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 66, promise of the coming of the new heaven and new earth. On and on it goes. So let me say again, you cannot affirm, ladies and gentlemen, that the old law was done away with, nailed to the cross, without affirming that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following was nailed to the cross. Well, you don't believe that. <laughs> Not if you're looking for the fulfillment of Matthew 25, 31 and following. Because let me reiterate and reemphasize, ladies and gentlemen, Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following anticipated the fulfillment of the feast days. It anticipated the fulfillment of Isaiah 65, 66. It, it anticipated the fulfillment of Isaiah 35, of Isaiah 40, of Isaiah 51, of Isaiah 54, and Isaiah 55. Not to mention prophecies in Malachi and other passages. Matthew 25, 31 and following is so undeniably tied to God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. You cannot affirm that the old covenant, including the feast days, were nailed to the cross without nullifying the promise of Matthew 25, 31 and following or you cannot say we're still looking for Matthew 25, 31 and following without saying we are still looking for the fulfillment of the old covenant law of Moses. Therefore, Israel remains God's covenant people and the old law remains valid today. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to pick back up. I, I want to finish some thoughts that I presented to you initially last week on 1 Peter chapter 1 
And Peter's prophecy of the salvation that was ready to be revealed as a prediction of the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. This is incredible stuff, ladies and gentlemen. And in reality and in truth, it falsifies all futurist eschatologies. So I'll see you on the flip side.